without further ado, I'm going to talk a bit about GraphQL client architecture today, specifically about a library we're developing at Formidable, which is called Urkel. A bit about me first, I'm a developer advocate at Formidable. You can find me on Twitter at underscore PhilPL. And if you know Formidable, you might have seen us before because of our open source libraries. We have quite the selection of libraries actually amongst not only Urkel, we also have Spectacle, Renature, and Victory, and a lot more that I can't fit onto a single slide. We're a consultancy, so if you need help solving any kind of problems with React Native development, React development, or beyond with design or project management, then let us know and we'll see how we can help. So, but I'm eventually actually just here to talk about Urkel today. And Urkel is a GraphQL client for the web. And specifically, we built it initially out of frustration with GraphQL at the time we started it. And we released V1, I think, at the beginning of 2019, so quite a while ago now. The goal was to build a new competing GraphQL client with a rather you know, alternative to the back then stagnant and monopolistic kind of environment for GraphQL. Even if you're using GraphQL today in your web apps, you might be using Apollo or Relay. We wanted to provide kind of a different client to that with a different feature set, kind of different advantages and drawbacks. So while I could talk more about how its API works, how you can get started with it, ultimately there are a lot of different ways in which you can use Urkel. And more importantly today, I wanted to focus on the guiding principles that we used to get started with Urkel, drive its development. And I've worked on a lot of larger open source projects, also smaller ones, and a lot of them never go beyond making a plan apart from making X thing work. And it's really important, in my opinion, to define some guiding principles like these to later on make good decisions in terms of API design, in terms of what your goals are, what paths to take. And ultimately, I'm not going to talk about everything Urkel related today, but hopefully I'm going to give you a good overview of how we built it. And of course, maybe that convinced you to check it out. Uh, maybe it tells you more about how Urkel is a bit different than maybe Apollo and Relay and see which kind of niche we're filling. And maybe it will also give you some ideas on how you can structure your open source projects and how you can kind of build this long-term vision. API design is hard after all to get right. And if you go to the Urkel site or to our repository, you might see a first description pop up. And this description may not be what you're seeing right now on the slides, but for today's purposes, I kind of describe Urkel and our guiding principles as being novel, versatile, and intuitive. So if you're thinking about GraphQL clients like it, you might see people on Twitter describing Urkel differently. You might hear small and fast, maybe even blazing fast as the buzzwords go. Uh, it's really overused terms. So instead, I'm going to kind of explain what I mean with these terms and with these guiding principles specifically. So if we're putting this into more words, we've kind of developed Urkel after these three principles. With novel, I meant we developed it from first principles. So we don't follow any kind of API design trends. We try to take inspiration, but not without second thought. We discuss things before adding them. Versatile means we keep Urkel unopinionated and flexible. So we would still like to have a small core library and then allow you to extend and customize it. Every API, every GraphQL schema is a bit different. You may have different needs and a whole different app they're using differently. So it's important to have a GraphQL cloud that can really adapt to what you need. Lastly, intuitive when extended. As we kind of extend Oracle and as we get later into its plugin system, which we call exchanges, all the additions that we make to a library like this, to an ecosystem, introduces a lot of complexity, a lot of new things to learn. And that needs to be managed. So one idea we had in the beginning was, well, whatever features we provide that can be added on, all of these need to be very intuitive and they can't compromise on ease of use. That was the short overview of things, but to kind of break this down a bit further, 
The first one was develop and first principles. We kind of wanted a novel approach and most projects are obviously not developed in a vacuum. There are previous projects, prior art, there's some context that you bring to every project you make. And we bring a lot of that baggage to our API design as well. We tend to not just implement things in a new way, but in one way that we're used to. So with Urkel, we consciously make the decision to prove that each API design actually works well and is actually what we want. So we're trying to actually make good choices and decisions and eliminate assumptions. And that's particularly important for us because, as I've mentioned, we're in a space where Relay and Apollo, specifically Apollo, dominate. So we have to treat them as prior art rather than blueprints that we're just imitating and copying. So although oftentimes it may seem like we're ending up on the same decision or similar APIs, a lot of these decisions have come from exploration of whether it could be different and alternative approaches could be taken. So there are some differences, there are some similarities, but uh, ultimately we're questioning everything that we do. If we kind of look at first principles in general, I've kind of mentioned that developing from first principles. All I'm saying is we're kind of trying to start from scratch here. When we built this GraphQL client, uh, we started from very simple fetcher. You may have heard of GraphQL request. It's very similar to that. All we, we did before was just send a request to GraphQL API, get a result, render it out. Um, so what is the role of GraphQL and GraphQL clients if we kind of start from scratch? And if we maybe start with a Google search and you type in why use GraphQL, you may come up with a bunch of common answers. So I hear the same things in how GraphQL is sold again and again, and people explain it in similar ways. So Oftentimes we hear maybe we'd find someone saying GraphQL is good at optimizing API data delivery. Because we don't over underfetch, we specify what we want, you know, it can be high performance due to that, we don't have waterfalls. The development speed can be improved with GraphQL. And that's not wrong. So it's common to build back and for front ends with GraphQL. It's kind of a good way to document an API. It's kind of a good way to get some you know, communication out of the way with the tooling in terms of maybe the backend team and frontend team if your teams are separated that way. And that's also not wrong, right? But ultimately, if we get to kind of the deeper point there, if we kind of get to the true strength of GraphQL, I would say we have to deeply look at the standard itself and its intention. And like everything, GraphQL wasn't developed in a vacuum. GraphQL is a set of standards that if we adopt them, we can agree on and standards that we can build on. Importantly, that means that we have a set of minimum operating principles. So that's kind of the part of standards we can agree on. GraphQL has features that an API team may choose naturally. You might want some schema documentation like GraphQL has built in. You might want to have stronger types. GraphQL has that as well. So a lot of the conversations that you may have in your team, if you wouldn't be using GraphQL, those all fall away. Docs, no docs, should we use Swagger? All of that is kind of answered pretty quickly. If you would, were to choose GraphQL, you're kind of starting on a higher common ground. That higher common ground already has made a couple of decisions, but ultimately its feature set and what GraphQL encompasses is something that a lot of people can agree on when it comes to APIs. So it's a combination of ideas that were around before GraphQL, but all in one bundle. So again, some of these things are actually pretty interesting and novel, but have been done before in different tooling. So type guarantees and kind of documentation like that is new. A lot of teams add Swagger for the REST APIs. Data shaping isn't new. A lot of different RESTful frameworks allow you to include or exclude data and uh, model relational data specifically. And GraphQL's error aware, error handling, a lot of teams will come up with their own error conventions. Maybe even when you use GraphQL, you might add some on top. Uh, it's all not very novel, but at the same time, these are all things we can agree on. And that brings us to the second part of why this can be useful. GraphQL kind of encompasses standards that we can build on. So when we use GraphQL, that kind of tooling commonality becomes a platform. 
everyone can rely on GraphQL being that, that schema language becomes kind of part of uh, how you can build on GraphQL, how you can build clients on GraphQL. And these are kind of the things that make GraphQL really interesting to interact with. So the client server language, the uh, GraphQL query language is pretty interesting in that we're kind of stepping out of the world of making simple HTTP requests, but at the same time, it allows a much more succinct way of communicating from clients to servers. So GraphQL clients specifically will always interact with that language. But at the same time, on the backend side of things, there is still that reusable ecosystem. The reusable ecosystem of the schema, for instance, using which we can automatically generate documentation. What's more interesting for GraphQL clients is this last part. GraphQL clients can do a lot because they can make assumptions. They can make assumptions during runtime and automate things. And if we kind of um, take that idea and we apply it onto the app tree and kind of onto how we build componentized apps, GraphQL abstracts relational data queries. We find that GraphQL's relational kind of data flow is very similar to how we already model data and state in componentized apps. If we split up our app into this tree of components, then GraphQL basically just allows us to define data requirements in each of these levels of these components. It kind of imitates a flow that we may already have in this context. So the GraphQL client's responsibility is then what's left over. It interconnects that data, by a set of data requirements. In our app, we have a bunch of queries that define what data we want. The GraphQL client's responsibility is just to query that and deliver it. So we can now kind of break down our goals. We want to bridge the UI code and GraphQL. We want to be able to basically easily define our queries and let the GraphQL client take care of requesting them. We want to deliver updates reactively, and that's pretty important because GraphQL has a lot of interdependencies between data as well. When we, for instance, send a mutation, we're sending an instruction to change some data on the backend. And that also means for the client that some other queries that depend on that same data must change. So any GraphQL client that interacts with data should have some mechanism to update queries to kind of take in new results as they come in from the API. And lastly, we kind of expect our GraphQL client to have some kind of abstraction of caching, no matter how simple or complex. And it should abstract a lot of the control flow because ultimately once we're in the UI world, we don't want to think about making a request, retrying requests and things like that. We want to kind of hand over that responsibility to the client. Now, how that looks in Urkel is kind of like this. We have a UI part and we have a client part. Uh, in the UI, you might use something like in our React bindings, we have use query. You will pass in a query and it will send them over to the client. We call that the operations flow. And that's kind of the inputs. As our components kind of change, they may generate new queries. So that means our query will subscribe to a new operation. And then once the client receives that, the UI will um, issue this query. It will start sending requests and it will eventually deliver results back. So as the UI subscribes to a certain operation, it will eventually get GraphQL results. And specifically, if we kind of break that up into certain time slices, this is kind of more of the React terminology here and kind of React looking, but it does apply to any kind of UI library and the principles will always be very similar. We have kind of a, a first stage where on some kind of mount, when the component initializes, it sends the query and it will eventually receive a first API result. So that will typically be once the API actually responds with that result. But the UI may also change its queries. You may actually update the component and it may want a different query result. And then it will receive that result as well in the future, but it may also receive more results, maybe because another part of the app has requested that same query. So it's not limited to a single update, to a single result. And then lastly, uh, when an operation has no subscribers anymore, when a component is done with one particular query, then it will be torn down. So at that point, the client will know that a query is not in use anymore. So we have this really nice flow of starting a subscription to some kind of query operation, getting some results, and then stopping it. 
And this kind of abstraction of reactive streams works for all kinds of UI libraries. This abstraction applies not only to React, but similar terminology and similar principles apply to other libraries. And that's kind of why uh, when we architected Urkel this way, this meant that we're also getting support for other UI libraries automatically. To kind of list a few, we kind of started with React support initially, and later on, Preact followed naturally because Preact is obviously kind of an offspring library of React. But we also now support Svelte and Vue. So on the website, we have a lot of fronts covered. And while Svelte and Vue are a bit newer, if you're working with Svelte or Vue and you have some opinions and you'd like to take a look, leave some feedback on the repo and we'll get to it. Uh, we're still improving some of these parts. And that kind of brings us to the second principle. So now that we've kind of seen how the subscriptions work to queries, we kind of have decided that a client must also be highly versatile and extensible. So we've seen the initial API, but this now comes down to a GraphQL.js reference implementation, but ultimately it's just a standard and everything that happens kind of in between it can change. So people are doing a lot of different things on top of GraphQL. We have different implementations of GraphQL subscriptions, for instance, via WebSockets. We have some uh, standard editions where we have some non-spec editions like file uploads or persisted queries. And kind of to support that, we can dive into how the client itself works. And we've kind of seen how an individual hook may send queries and receive results. And on a kind of macro level, if we look at the client itself, the client treats all of those queries from all parts of UI as one stream, one like kind of big input of multiple operations. So the client receives all of these operations from your different parts of your app and will deliver results corresponding to each one. So it's kind of like a huge train station with lots of arrivals, and lots of departures, and it manages all of that together. So it doesn't differentiate between different queries once they enter the client, and then once they exit the client and go to your UI, it kind of splits them back out. This is kind of done using a unique identifier that is generated, but that is all treated internally in the client. Um, I'm not going to get away without showing some code. So specifically, instantiating a client is pretty simple. We have kind of our URL, that's the basic start. And these exchanges are optional. So here we started to customize something. We're passing in three exchanges, which we're calling the default behavior. So that's deduplication, caching, and fetching. Fetching obviously being the one that goes to make the request to the GraphQL API. And this is the last one in the list. And that brings us to our plugin system exchanges and actually to the sensibility part of Urkel. We can only make Urkel as flexible as its plugin system. We have these exchanges that are like middleware that you may have in Express or Redux. They provide some added logic. Um, so they're like plugins, but the slide is really long. Basically, Urkel's client just delegates all of the real work to exchanges. So all we need to know about exchanges today is that they're plugins and Urkel does everything using these exchanges, everything using a plugin. So you can customize them and everything's abstracted into those. But in this talk, I'm not going to get into how they actually work internally because it's really similar just to Redux or Express middleware. And to kind of drive that point, um, Urkel's client only makes up about 40% of the core packages size. The rest are all core logic and exchanges. So Urkel's client makes even less of the core packages code in terms of lines of code, but most of it goes into having all of these separate exchanges. And it's not really important which ones there are. We have some for retry logic, some for authentication. We are seeing the fetch exchange again. We have some for persisted queries and file uploads and so on. But what's important is that exchanges really do do everything in Urkel. So we have a cache exchange and a second exchange called graph cache. So that brings me to the point that even normalized caching is just an exchange and optional. Caching itself is part of this middleware flow. Caching itself can be swapped out and caching itself is just an extension that you can customize. And we have two different ways of handling caching. So we have a so-called document cache and that's our default behavior. And this default behavior is like the browser behavior. 
a cache like a browser, it has a certain you know, key associated to the operation, like a URL to a JSON document, and we're caching by that. And whenever a mutation just sends another request and it contains the same type name as a query did, that query is invalidated, so it's refetched. Compare that to normalized caching, which is probably more like what you would do if you were setting up a manual Redux store. So normalized caching automatically derives different entities from our GraphQL data. So every object is stored separately. It's something like a database structure in tables. And any changes that one query makes may also be propagated to other queries. So everything kind of shares data, and this is the other side of the extreme of caching. While the document cache is really volatile and will invalidate data aggressively, the normalized cache is really conservative and will keep data around for as long as possible. Having seen that the plugin system in Urkla, so the exchanges are extremely flexible and we can easily add a lot of exchanges. We can, for instance, say we want to add retry logic, persisted queries, all of these features. We're adding a lot of exchanges and that must not trade in ease of use. So one principle that we introduced very early on was no matter what's added, ease of use must still ever, like remain very intuitive. That also applies to the exchanges themselves. A lot of them are in separate packages, and these packages are often built to be more opinionated than Urkel's core package, than Urkel's client and its bindings. So while you're adding more exchanges, you kind of gain to a higher degree of like kind of an opinionated degree, so to speak. And the other part is that that means we had to make a decision on how to kind of structure Urkel. And as I mentioned, we made the decision to have separate packages. And a lot of concepts in Urkel in general are kind of designed fractally. So that means when you're looking at Urkel, you can get started really quickly. We have some basic guides that you can start in a couple of minutes. But once you kind of get through it, you may reach more concepts that you want to understand that you can dive in into separately. So learning Urkel is kind of a step-by-step -step process instead of you having to look at the entire API or kind of see one API while you're actually searching for another. And that's reflected in our docs as well. Our docs is very much structured by topic rather than you know being a one large guide to step through. The basics guide would give you a getting started guide and after that it's pretty much a free flow guiding you through different sections so you can get deeper into the topics you're actually interested in. We kind of have not really seen any of the particular decisions yet we've made. We've kind of seen a bit of the API design that we've initially made and kind of how we achieve these principles in general. Uh, but I wanted to kind of give some examples of decisions we've made in the past that are, I think, pretty interesting and different from how you would usually approach this if you were to start a GraphQL client right now. Uh, one of them is each of the bindings we have gives you a fetching flag. And this fetching flag basically intuitively tells you, uh, is an API request being sent? And as we've seen previously, Urkel kind of um, has this client, we send it queries, it gives us results. There is not really a fetching Boolean flag that we have. And instead, that means we've kind of replaced it. Every kind of UI piece that connects to the client decides it's on its own whether it's fetching or not. And it's doing so by matter of finding out whether it's waiting for a result. So there are two different states in which you can be in. Let's say you mount a component. It can either be waiting for a result or not waiting for a result. But it knows whether it's still waiting by seeing whether the cache has responded synchronously, so immediately with a result or not. If your UI binding is not receiving any result from the client yet, it knows to set fetching to true. You know that you need to wait. And then once it receives a result, that's when it knows that fetching can be false and it kind of merges that result and it makes it accessible to the UI. So that means that we don't really have a flag that actually indicates whether a network request is being sent. Instead, it's very much delay-based, something synchronous or not. But there is a second flag that is pretty useful to actually find out whether you can expect a new result. We have this flag called stale. And the idea of this flag is you never really need to know whether something is fetching or not because you primarily are interested in whether you have to show a loading screen or not. But at the same time, if you don't show a loading screen, and you show a result, you also maybe want to know 
whether that result is stale or not, meaning whether you can expect a new network result that will update the current screen. Because if you don't know about this, you may introduce some flickering where you're quickly switching to new values and that doesn't look very nice. Uh, so that's kind of a flag to indicate that something's loading. So in practice, that means you may get a result immediately from the client if you tell it that you kind of just want to use a cached value. But you can also tell it that you want a network result afterwards. So then the client will start fetching a new result, and all you will see is still your old result, but set with the stale flag to true. And then once the new result comes back from the API, that's when the stale flag will be false again, and you will have a new set of data. So kind of these little mechanisms to make sure that your UI renders up-to-date data or older data if it would like to. Now, one of the interesting ones is I've kind of mentioned our normalized cache really briefly. But what's really interesting about it is that we've added a lot of smaller features to it that might not be visible on the surface if you're coming from Apollo. And one of these features is called schema awareness, and it gives us the ability to render partial results. Really has something similar as well. We're still improving the API kind of to align on something similar. But the whole idea is you can pass schema information to the normalized cache. Once the normalized cache has schema information, it can make a decision of whether to render a page early. So for instance, if you've already been on a listing page and you go to a details page, maybe these two display the same item so they can kind of share some data. We kind of send a query for the list. We have some common fields that we're requiring and our schema says that these both render an item. But once we go to the details page, we fetch some more fields that the cache doesn't know about yet. So one thing that we've added with schema awareness is if you're kind of enabling this feature, it can give you null for the details, or at least it can set the next nullable field to null while it's waiting for more data. Now, all of this is pretty tricky to make safe, but GraphCache layers and orders changes or results as it receives it from the API automatically and safely. So it does a lot of different work under the hood to kind of enable these features, but two of the internals that are interesting are optimistic updates and commutative layering. So specifically, optimistic updates would be changes you make when a mutation is sent that are reflected in the, in the UI immediately while the network request is still sending. And part of making that safe is kind of a layering approach. We want to be able to layer changes in our normalized cache so that once a real result comes back for your mutation, these temporary changes in your cache can be removed. All of that complexity sounds pretty intimidating when you read about it in like a more hidden page in the docs. But all of that is actually quite interesting because it enables us to add offline support even. We think GraphQL is a really good candidate for bringing offline support to the web because of its type guarantees and because of its kind of runtime automation features that a GraphQL cloud can implement. And GraphCache supports offline support, but uh, that kind of goes beyond the scope of explanation in this talk. I have a blog post on this. The URL is on kitten.sh if you want to find out more about how our normalized cache works and how it kind of achieves this. Now, I've kind of shown a bunch of different features and a bunch of different oddities. Kind of what I then want to get to is that the last point is the goal we set ourselves is we want to do more with less bytes, keep performance high. And that's a pretty easy goal to set, a harder goal to keep. But as it stands, Urkel is still extremely compact for the feature set it has. The core package is extremely small and the normalized cache as it is adds a minimal amount of bundle size. We have a comparison page that goes into detail of that, but compared to Apollo and Relay, it can achieve much smaller sizes. And even more so, in an actual app, if you have really simple requirements, uh, like GraphQL request of just sending requests, there are even some tricks to swap out the GraphQL standard library to make sure the app is even smaller. But as it stands out of the box, Urkel always aims to keep your app fast and add as little bytes as possible. And that kind of leaves me only at the outro, uh, where I would probably reveal you know, our secret roadmap and future features, but our roadmap is not so secret. And you can find it on the projects board on GitHub. And this is kind of part of our public RFC process. Uh, you can always go in, anyone can go in and submit RFCs if you have an 
an idea of what you'd like to see change in the API. You can start a discussion. Eventually, it will go into ready and planning, and then either a core team member or someone else can pick this task up. So everything that's ongoing in Oracle right now is very public. And to kind of summarize specifically what's coming, we're kind of currently working on having more examples in repo because our examples are a bit outdated and we'd like to see more demos. We are working with the team at the Guild to bring better GraphQL code generator support to Urkel. So that will kind of include a relay-like framework approach as well. And that brings you to the last one, Urkel framework. We kind of like to move towards a place where we can have more recommendations for users like Relay does, but kind of still keep our flexibility. So you could opt into its framework features and kind of get an easier method or recipe to apply to your apps to so you more quickly assemble it and kind of use GraphQL. But that's kind of it for today. That's all I have. Thank you. There we go. All right, Phil, that was awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction to Urkel. This is a very exciting library that uh, I've been having my eye on is one one that I want to get more familiar with. So appreciate the uh, the overview. That was uh, that was great. I think uh, if you're up for it, we can move into a little bit of Q and A. There are a couple of things that came through in the the live chat. So Ben asks. Uh, he says we're using Remix doing GraphQL fetching on the server side. Does Urkel support running on the server? It does, yeah. We have a package called Next Urkel. Uh, Next just is so ubiquitous, so frequently used that we made a package to make that easier. That's actually the first example we're launching because there's a lot of different ways to use Next for static rendering, server-side rendering, just client-side only. There is the old get initial props API, the new APIs. Um, there are a lot of combinations and ways in which you can use Next. Um, and Remix is a lot more reduced. So it's actually uh, contacting the Remix team about that to kind of start talking to them about it. As far as I know, they're maybe not quite there yet to think about things like uh, integration with Urkel, but we've already offered them to specifically build examples for and with Remix. Awesome. That's cool. Uh, kind of a specific question with, ne I guess, the next case. Um, what happens when you, so like you'll, you'll do your GraphQL call in the server portion of your your components um but then how do you actually let's say you you do a query to hydrate your page when it loads or something like that and then you want to deal with mutations later and updating state uh and keeping it in sync from that initial call that happened on the server is there like a, a bunch of trickery that happens to make that uh to make that go I, i'm thinking of cases where like with apollo for example like if you um I mean, I guess you could do it with Apollo, but if you maybe use something like GraphQL request to, to make that initial request on the server side, get some data, and then you want to interact with something like Apollo, you've got things that are sort of not talking to each other. Um, is there anything special that happens uh, with Urkel to make, to make that work? There's not much special happening uh, per se. So if you're just interested in server-side rendering, all that's happening is we're making some uh, fetch request on the server side instead of mm -hmm. on the client side. So what we've actually decided to do is make a generic SSR exchange. And that SSR exchange collects all of these results on the server. And on the client side, it can sometimes, like the rest of the caching pipeline, go, hey, I, I've already fetched this on the server. You can just use okay. this result instead. Um, as far as I'm aware, Apollo doesn't do this. And they instead high, rehydrate the entire normalized cache. And that has some disadvantages in terms of what can happen in terms of that data tearing. Uh, whereas the worst case that can happen with the SSR exchange is it will just fetch on the client side if it doesn't find a match. Gotcha. That is a bit separate from persistence, though. Once you use our normalized cache, uh, there is also persistence for offline support, where it persists to, uh, for instance, index DB or local storage. Right. And that's actually more tricky than servers at rendering because there you don't have the results synchronously. So it actually pauses all of these uh, operations, rehydrates all of that data because that's asynchronous, and then it looks and goes, hey, do I have this in my cache now? Right. Um, and that's a bit easier because our bindings, again, don't care about any kind of fetching state. They decide themselves whether they're currently waiting or not. So mm -hmm. this kind of just works. But there is some more trickery going on once you would use offline support rather than just server-side rendering. Got it. Okay. Very cool. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we'll move to the next one here. Is there an easy way to migrate from Apollo to Urkel? Any kind of uh, tooling around that, perhaps? 
Yeah, so we don't have tooling to migrate directly, but that's mostly because if you're using React or Preact with the Apollo hooks, uh, then it's really easy already to migrate. The hooks are very similar. We haven't written a code mod for it even because all you have to switch over is just put the query in some options. Our APIs are very similar, but um, it will really depend because our normalized caching approach is very different. And actually, when we came up with it, we were working on a couple of apps and we had all of these update functions in different parts of our UI. So often you have one part of the Apollo app updating another query here and there, and uh, once your app grows to a certain size, the funny thing that happens is you, you're trying to centralize it again because like four parts of your app are now updating, mm -hmm. I don't know, the user because of the header bar, or all of these you know, update your uh, shopping cart if you're building an e-commerce app. So you're building all of these utilities and bringing them back together. And we actually decided for our normalized cache that all of that should start out in a central configuration hmm. because it all is a concern that is separate from your UI. Your UI code should never contain instructions on how to update the rest of your cache because in that particular piece of code, you're just interested in making that change to send that mutation. Um, so no, that, that normalized caching code won't port one-to-one. -one. But the APIs and the principles of how the caches work are similar because they're both normalized caches. There is probably less to do in terms of optimistic updates because of our layering approach. Um, you're probably able to write some more simple code and will just work. Um, but yeah, a code mod was an idea, but it mm -hmm. wasn't requested very often yet. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, um, I think that's it for questions. So thank you so much for answering those two, Phil. And thank you so much for your presentation.